Welcome to Strip Cover Look, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for part six of a seven part series. Is that correct, Dalton? You got it right this time. I'm so proud of you. Part six of a seven part series on Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games. This is the entirety of the text, the last bit that we read. And uh, yeah, we finished it. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about that because this is where this novel falls apart for me. I, okay, I, okay. Um, I was wondering about that because you had the implications of the, you had the implications of this set up much earlier in yes. the text. I don't like this ending. I never have. I think this is a good read up until this part. Okay. So, uh, what did we read this week? Uh, Katniss and Peeta continue to live it up for the camera. Peeta accidentally kills Foxface with some poison berries because he is absolutely useless as a person. Outfox the fox. Outfox the fox. We get a great showdown with Kato, but the real enemy turns out to be Mutations, uh, which I think is a gorgeous scene, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Katniss and Peeta basically Romeo and Juliet their way to victory. But all isn't well. Haymitch warns Katniss that she has basically challenged the government's authority, and we set up for the sequel, baby. Yeah. We're moving forward. The Hollywood ending. So, Adrian, where do you want to start? How would you spell mutation? I don't know. Is that the actual spelling of mut... No, there's only one T in mutations. 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 Um, okay. Um... <clears throat> Is, what, is there any place you would like to start? Uh, do we want to start with the mutations? Is that a, a good place to start? That's where this? the reading starts. We can start there. So I'm very much about that scene. I think it's well done. I think it's interesting. Uh, it is a, a little off the wall. That's fine. But the idea that the game masters have basically uh, taken the dead contestants and formed them into beasts to attack the two is a great idea and that entire uh, it's a good four or five pages where Peter and Katniss are basically laying on top of the cornucopia waiting for Cato to die listening to him suffer is gorgeous yeah um so I would never contend that it is poorly written one thing about the scene that bugs me is the fact that I keep forgetting the rules of this world okay because most of it's not hard sci-fi most of it's not soft sci-fi. It's, it's just world. dystopian, right? Okay. So then you've got these little things like uh, the tracker jackers thrown in every once in a while, just when we need the plot to move forward. Um, which obviously, just as we need the plot to move forward, just as we need the games to move forward. So it is a well-crafted, poorly crafted device. Okay. But um, I don't... <clears throat> I think it's interesting, but I wish... that things like that were thread more evenly throughout the games. Okay. Uh, I, I will give it to you that these always seem to be a, a tool to move the plot forward. But it is even stated in the book that this is a tool to move the plot forward. Yeah. Uh, because this is reality TV. Uh, I, I do think that it is reasonable. It is part of this world. We already have the tracker jackers. We have the mocking jays. Uh, at the very beginning of the text, we talk about uh, basically government creations uh, just living in the forest. Well, <clears throat> not government creations. They're government mutations, right? Government mutations. Um, this is a little different. Okay. This is taking elements of a formerly living being and creating something different with them. Okay. So that's a little bit different, right? So instead of basically <clears throat> weaponizing animals with tracker jackers and the mockingjays breeding them or altering their dna we are creating uh basically a homunculus if i if i may and that is coming from the dead contestants which is dastardly that that is a dark tone for a young adult novel uh and i'm i'm really about it i i think it works well i think it's written well and uh you, you can suspend your disbelief long enough to say, you know, okay, this is reasonable to me. Yeah, um, it, so, so it's definitely, one thing that it does raise is the, the question of the veracity of the um, capital. Okay. The question of the capital's, the question of veracity of the capital's malice. I think that's a correct way to state that. Um, because essentially what you're doing is you're saying that so long as we continue to torture you, you will never die, which is analogous to hell, right? Okay. You are 
creating a hell. For, so especially with a character like Rue, Rue ends up in one of these mutations, um, which is terrible to read, right? Okay. We didn't even let Rue die. Rue was a good guy. Yes. Um, or, or Foxface. Foxface never hurt anybody. Nobody is safe in this. Right. And no one is not that no one is safe. No one is ever safe, even after death. Okay. This is one of the, uh, <clears throat> if I may digress, this is one of the big gripes that someone like Christopher Hitchens had with religion. Um, in the Jewish religion, hell's not really a thing. Um, and he, Christopher Hitchens always said, not until Jesus Christ, meek and mild, could God torture you forever. So this is something like that. Okay. Where we have something there to prolong the suffering. You can't even die and escape the capital's malice. I like that choice of word that you use, suffering, because a lot of my big review that we're going to have next week comes to this. This is really a novel about suffering, and we are prolonging that suffering. Absolutely so. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, but I, for a young adult novel, this seems a bit of a stretch. This is a very dark, ominous moment in this. Uh, we, like I said, we have the animalistic uh, mocking jays, the tracker jackers and something. Uh, but this is taking human life and basically bastardizing it and creating an abomination that is going to uh, kill off everyone until we get satisfaction. Yeah. Uh, it, it's an interesting concept, and I do enjoy it. And really, at this point that I first read through this, I am in. I am 100% in this novel. It's not until after Cato dies, that gorgeous scene where Cato's suffering is drawn out, that we start to lose our uh, our pace with this a little bit. It's where things start to slip away from me. Okay, we lose pace there for sure. I also don't know how realistic it is. We are set up to believe that these mutations mm -hmm. are ravenous. Okay. They are hungry. They've been starved. Um, they are angry, right? They're not going to abandon a kill. And it is, they, they, I don't know, is that, I, this scene might be poorly written. Okay. The, the post-attack scene might be poorly written. Are those mutations constantly there chomping on him? So that is a little bit of a gray area. So Kato is covered uh, basically neck down in armor. So he can withstand the attack from the mutations, but let's be honest, you get a big feral dog, one good chomp at the head, you're done. Yeah. So drawing that out all throughout the night it is, is nice. I enjoy that constant suffering where the two remaining contestants have to wait for their victory and they have to envelop themselves in the sufferings of another and just hope that everything's going to end well before finally, you know, everything's done, put him out of his misery. But I don't know if it's realistic. I don't know if that attack's going to last all night. And I don't know where those dogs are. I don't know if they are chewing on him. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things... Have you ever watched wildlife footage of a, of a kill? Occasionally, maybe when it comes across. It's not a kill, right? It's a, I'm going to eat you until you die. Pretty much. Th which it was where I thought this was going. And then I remembered, like you said, the armor... But then it made it seem like he was suffering. So was he being, like, is the armor not, like, metal armor? Is the armor semi-malleable? Like, um, how when you wear a bulletproof vest? Yeah. yeah. I, I think the armor is uh, kind of a futuristic sci-fi enough that we just have to accept the fact that it's some kind of new-grade armor that protects him, uh, whether it's metal or not. But he's still able to be chomped. Yes. A, you still die from that. B, I don't care, did they not have dog noses? Could they not smell the flesh on his face? Like, I, I, it, it's, I will say that part is f poorly written for me. It's poorly okay. executed. Uh, now, moving on past that, we get the Romeo and Juliet scene. So I've been doing a little bit of a series on my own, uh, the How to Read Books Good series, and we're going to get to this chapter here eventually where everything can come back to Shakespeare. And this is as Shakespeare as it gets. The two star-crossed lovers, odds against them, decide the only way that we can be happy is to take our own lives together. We're just going to put ourselves out of this misery. There will be no victor. And in that moment, the games change. You're like, oh, no, sorry, it's okay. You both can win. Which you can imagine very, very vividly somewhere off screen, someone yelling, 
shit. Yep. What, what do we right. do? What do we do? <laughs> Push the button. Yeah. That is where this book loses me. In that moment where the announcer comes across and says, hey, by the way, we double check the rules. Sorry about the luck. There can be only one. In that moment, after spending an entire night listening to this other kid suffer, Katniss picks up an arrow, takes out PETA. PETA takes that knife, takes out Katniss. Either or, at that point, this is a damn fine novel. Because we get away from this idea of this uh, romantic young adult book, and we take it some more more primal, where there can be only one victor. And if we want to go forward with a series from this, then we have to deal with that. Well, then we have to rename it Highlander. Then we have to rename it Highlander. I think there can be only one Highlander. I like that. You put an accent on one syllable there. That's okay. And only one syllable. <laughs> I'm American. I can do that. It's fine. There can uh, be only one Highlander. The... <laughs> My Sean Connery's not the best today. I'm sorry. Uh, but no, I, I really think, honestly, in that moment, if somebody just like goes full primal rage and realizes this is it, there's no getting out of this, and takes out the other, we've got a great series. We have a character winning, but still suffering greatly. Because now that is on them. That damages the character so much more than, okay, fine, you both can win. Even if we add that little bit of a, about a chapter afterwards where, you know, hey, Mitch has the aside saying, you know, hey, the government's pissed at you. You did something wrong. That adds a little spice to this, but I think it could have been so much better. I don't know. Um, I, for one, am someone who is inclined to enjoy the middle finger to establishment okay and in that sense i do sort of like the direction that we choose to go uh i can certainly see the argument that you're making um i would never i could i would postulate that that is not the ending so that we can still sell this as a young adult book okay but in fairness the hunger games was at the forefront of the young adult movement it was. So there might not have been resistance to this being a young adult text with that because there were, the rules were not as rigid as they are now. Okay. Um, I really think, though, that scene, if Katniss just puts Peta down, even if you want to stretch it out a little bit where she has to make that difficult decision and she puts him down, it adds so much more to this, so much more depth than we can Romeo and Juliet our way out of this. A, I think you have to pull it off or it ruins the book. B, it adds more depth on an individual... I don't even know if it adds more depth on an individual level. It certainly would add more depth on an individual level to this single novel. Moving forward, as this is a series, I think that you get more depth out of that decision not being made. Because there's... I, I don't know where this series goes. I have no idea what book two could be. But I have to imagine that if this was my series, it becomes, well, the capital's pissed off at your district. Everyone gets to suffer a little bit more now. That's where we're going with this. Okay, so... Uh, I have read book two, by the way. I've not read the third, the <clears throat> final book in the series, but I have read the second. Um, I, I don't know, though. There is such a glorious buildup to this moment. Because there is that moment where Peta and Katniss are talking about Haymitch and Haymitch's life. And, you know, if we win this, we're going to have a house in the Victor's Village, whatever it's called, uh, with Haymitch. And it kind of dawns on Katniss that, you know, this drunk that I've been making fun of all the time, he's damaged goods. Yeah, so, uh, I'd like to get to that. That happens a little bit on 3 of 6. Did you have more with it, that? It, there is that. That is put in there, and that is just plugged in the back of our brain, where Haymitch has had to make these horrible decisions. And his life is basically every year, I have to, you know, get close to these kids and watch them die. And I have to be okay with it. That is in the back of our brain as we're moving towards that final scene. If we play off that and add that to Katniss's guilt where she has to put Peta down, or even just throw a monkey wrench in there and have Peta put Katniss down, that's good, man. That could be played off so well. It could be. It could also be ruinous. But here's the thing. If you're looking at the standard hero's journey, okay, this is perfect. Because you have... You've left your little village, you've assumed the role, and now you're making a difference from where your master had lied, 
right? Where your master had uh, run his game. And we become self-aware at the end. And this is the very first part of a trilogy, right? Is it okay. three or four? I believe it's three. Okay. Um, are you sure it's three? 100%. Okay. So, so there's four movies, I think. That's where I'm getting at. Okay. So that's the first part of the, th the three parts of the hero's journey. Okay. So in that sense, you have a very beautiful story of the arc of a hero's journey and the fall, a little bit better than where you started, in a book, but also this book, as part of a trilogy, is the beginning of the rise. Okay. Um, now, where, what we have here is also hero building, because Katniss goes back to her town, district, and presumably everyone's gonna have to suffer more because the capital's pissed off at you. But everyone's going to be fine with that suffering. You know why? Because we stuck it to you. We got winners, baby. Guess what? It's just like, and this is this goes into another point that I had here that you mentioned. Um, the Royals, the sad sack of the Major League Baseball world, every once in a while we'll get on a tear and we'll be a pain in the Yankees' ass. And guess what? A season where we, we win 40 games, that's all right because we stuck it to the man, okay. you know? So if every, what it becomes is the forging of an identity where you know what? We suffer more, but we're part of something. Okay. We suffer more. This District 12 sucks. Boy, does it suck. Well, we got but that we one got up. a winner. We got a, we bucked your system, didn't we? We got that one up. Um, so honestly, the way you're talking about it, and again, I've only read the second book on this. I've not read the third, uh, but it, that's basically where we're going here. If we want to look at that hero's journey, how you said, you know, this is just the beginning. Boy, do we take a nosedive after this. Boy, do these characters have to suffer now. Oh, yeah. But then we build back up to what actually we're looking at here, which you've alluded to. It's overthrowing a dystopian government. Yeah. That's what we're getting at. Here. Which I, I think, um, you. how often do you get that in literature? I, you don't get that terribly often. And, and again, I, I hate to keep lumping it into this category. This is very different than most YA that we get. Uh, usually it, it is not as big as we're overthrowing the government. Uh, but that's where we're moving into in this. And we definitely get these seeds of that being planted towards the end here. Uh, where now Katniss is basically public enemy number one. And it's pulled off. It is. It I mean, is. It, 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 this, is, this is good stuff, I think. Are you all right? Yeah, I keep trying to, like, I think I'm touching your foot, and it's your boot. I'm so sorry. I've been playing footsie with your boot for the last ten minutes. I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Well, now I'm expecting footsie. But anyway, uh, I, I will grant that. It, it's not a terrible ending, and it is pulled off. I just think it could have been more had this, uh, just had a little more gusto to it. If we just said, you know what, I'm going to write one really good book. I'm not going to try to push for the Hollywood ending. I'm not going to push for the movie and the series. I just want to write one good zinger that's just going to be something that stands out. I think it could have been done with this. It, it could have, but does that, does that disallow what was actually done here? That's a difficult question. I think you're being pissy just to be pissy. You think so? I think so. I think, I think honestly, and far be it for me to be the one who says this, but I think you're using your, your batch degree to try and tear this down. Oh no. Because you're an elitist oh, a little bit. No. In that situation, you're becoming the elitist. I've become the enemy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, when I first read this, I was very disappointed in the ending. Like I said, after that scene with the mutations, where it's a choice, where one must survive, I want that kill. I want that kill because I didn't see that coming. I thought we were just gonna have a nice, happy little ending moving forward. Well, you've got the, you've, you're talking about the twist, right? You were hoping for a second twist. You get the second twist. I don't like the second twist. And then twist. you get a third. Yeah, there's too many twists. It's the third twist you don't like. You should not have M. Night Shyamalan on your consult here. Uh, there are too many twists. Are there too many twists? You think there, so? It's a power struggle. Okay. It's basically... With, now, I, I, I think that you, you've definitely had an argument in so far as does Katniss really like this fella that much? that when push comes to shove and they tell her, well, it is just one of you, screw you both, that she's not gonna arrow him through the chest. 
does she like him that much? We never really get that. No, because we this whole build-up has been a ruse for Katniss. Right. Um, which I think there's a lot to be said there. And boy, I wish this was a second reading for me because there is so much roiling under the surface with that that I, I, I don't know that I understand enough to touch on. Okay. Um, were you going somewhere else? Not particularly, no. Um, so we talked a little bit, we've already talked a little bit about the Royals, and we've talked a little bit about Hamish, okay. right? And I came to the conclusion while reading this, that mystery of Hamish winning the Hunger Games, right? They don't know how it happened. It was brought up. It was 30 years ago. 30 years ago to the year, to the season, the Royals won the World Series. They, the last time they had won the World Series was the year I was born. Okay. When I was 30, they won it again. And it's always been so because Kansas City sort of a District 12, isn't it? it? Well. It sort of sucks to live here. We have no heroes. There's <laughs> nothing going on. Everyone's dirty and no one can read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kansas City. Everyone's dirty and no one can read. That's going on, sure. <laughs> That's gorgeous. <laughs> but um, it had always been lore. Of the Royals winning the World Series and how glorious it was. Um, but no one knows how it happened. <laughs> That's fair. No it one is. in my generation knows. We, we've got this, we've got a couple scenes of the 80s Royals. You've got George Brett running out of the dugout and cursing at a referee saying he had a pine tar bat. Um, and you've got the final out in the World Series that they won. But that's it. No one knows how it happened. No one's ever seen someone hit a base hit from the 1985 Royals. I'm going to award this one to you. Because this threw me off a little bit when they started talking about, you know, how Hamish did it. Because if this is your world, this is your, you know, what, what's the, uh, the, the baseball thing? World Series? Yeah. You're going to know how it happened. Because that's the mythos. But you're going to know how Hamish did it. But that is a damn fine point. Isn't it? It really is. And I was th I was on your side this whole time until there's a paragraph in here where they say something. I think it's 30 years. Where they said it was 30 years ago. And I'm like, whoa, that's too weird. Okay. And then it just struck that nerve with me that, yeah, no one. Or like the, the Chiefs Super Bowl in 1969. Yeah, nobody know what happened. I've, I've got in my mind Otis Taylor catching a touchdown pass. 40 yards downfield. That's it. I know Lynn Dawson was there. He smoked a cigarette and drank a beer after the game in the locker he did. room. It's an iconic picture. That's all I've got, right? No, I, I have no idea the score. I have no idea if it was an easy game. I have no idea. Sometimes I forget who they played. That is interesting to look at this from a sports I, I, a sports glance. What, I don't know what the word I'm looking at here. A sport, it, basically, hero building stance. It is. Because you know what happened, you know the legend behind it, but you don't know the details. And here's another example that I came up with. The Bible. How many Christians do you know? Quite a few. We live in Kansas City where everything, everyone's dirty and no one can read. Vast majority. There's, everyone's a Christian. There's so many things, and I'm not saying this to harp on Christians, but it, it's an easy example for me to see. Okay. There was the movie with Noah, with um, the movie about Noah with Russell Crowe. Okay. And people kept wondering where those rock people came from. That's in the Bible. No one knows the Bible. No one's read it. <laughs> yeah, no one's. It's, it's just it's, what it's, you it's grew another, up with. Right. You accept it. it. You are. You are cultured in to these things. Interesting. And you only, with things that you accept as your culture. You only absorb what you never question, right? Okay. Everyone knows the story of Jesus and the three wise men. They came, when Jesus was born, three wise men came. Who questions it? It's fair. What did they bring? What did they represent? So what, you know what I mean? Like everyone just sort of sees, ah, oh, you know, there's the manger scene and Jesus. Okay. And these, I say these people like I'm pointing at someone, but it, people accept culture that they don't question. And when they don't question it, it becomes this 
you, you fill in the blanks. And you, you never really get around to understanding what happened. And that was just something that sort of struck me about, about the Haymitch thing. It's a really good point. And honestly, I don't know what Suzanne Collins is doing now besides counting her money. Uh, but if there were to be a prequel to The Hunger Games where we got 30 years ago the story of Haymitch, Haymitch. and it's a three-part series, you know, the build-up, the games, and then the aftermath. Haymitch Rising? I'd read it. Haymitch Rising. I like it. Uh, do you have any other points you want to hit well, here before we move to a full review next speaking week? Speaking of Haymitch Rising, um, the was it Hannibal Rising, right? Yes. Um, 347... Now is the time to run away to the woods, to hide in the trees. And this, she's talking about when, uh, when they bring the suffering people home and she can hear them crying, she runs away. Tell me that's just not a dead image for Silence of the Lambs. Okay. That's why Clarice r ran away was because she could hear the lambs, the lambs crying. crying. Interesting. Yeah, so that was, a, that was a weird little thing that was sort of thrown in there for us. Hmm. Um, the, the, um, oh, I don't know why I wrote this down. They talk about having a test for intelligence. They didn't test them for intelligence, but they did test them. Okay. They tested them for brutality. And that's how they got into the game. You know what I mean? Like that, that was how people, oh, because of betting. Because she said if they had known Foxface was such a threat... She would have scored better, but they didn't test for intelligence, which it just sort of goes to show you um, that type of mentality with gambling. Okay. You know what I mean? I want to know how brutal they are. It's fair. I don't want to know how intelligent they are. It's interesting. I, I'm really still stuck on your Haymitch point. Like, I even dog-eared that page to bring it up as a little strange, uh, the whole conversation with Haymitch there, but like... Good points were made. I'm happy with this. Shall we carry this on to next week? Um, sure. We can, yeah, I can right. carry this over. So we will be back next week with a full review of Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games. A lot of interesting stuff to talk about. I think this went quite well today, wrapping this book up. And if you'd like to join us on that adventure next week as we review The Hunger Games, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. Give this video a like as well. We always appreciate it. And if you'd like to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover Lit, there's a link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below.